Hey everyone, welcome to Zen and Tech, our podcast focused on centering your inner geek and using technology to help you deal with the stresses of your connected life. I'm Renee and your host for the show is Georgia. Before we begin, I just want to remind you that while Georgia is a therapist, she's not your therapist. Everything said or implied in this episode is for informational and entertainment purposes only and shouldn't be taken in any way as a replacement for personal, professional care. Georgia, how are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? Good. You communicated that to me so effectively. I now have an absolute idea of how you are feeling. Good. I try to be concise and clear when I speak. Simplify, 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 and then you cross off the first two simplifies. Exactly. Less is more. Absolutely. So um, with that as an introduction, can I ask what we're talking about this week? We are going to be speaking about communication. What a and coincidence. And how to communicate effectively. Nice, because I mean, we did a show previously on uh, communications, mostly in a family sort of relationship sense. But this is more about sort of getting your point across, maybe more public speaking-esque. This is about um, public speaking, about being a boss in a company, about giving a keynote, and having it so that it is gripping, it listens to people. Also, I have a lot of people that are dealing with social situations and having to speak to people that they do not know, they might feel uncomfortable in that situation, and how to get through it so that people end up leaving feeling like they understand, they know what you're dealing with, and that they trust you and that you have the confidence to lead them. Nice. So, I mean... Uh, are we talking like the the existing sort of communications people? Do you want to like assess – Apple just had – we're in an interesting time right now. Apple just had their big WCW keynote uh, last week. This week, uh, Microsoft had two sort of keynotes. They had the introduction of the Surface and the Windows 8 developer preview. And next week, Google has I.O., where they're probably going to show the next version of Android, maybe a Google tablet. Who knows? Uh, that's a lot of – top technology company communications right there. And you can take a look by seeing the difference between the two of them. How do you give an effective speech and how don't you give an effective speech? How do you imbue trust, belief, and passion in your product through delivering a presentation to someone else versus how do you make people think, you know what, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure that you believe it, so I don't believe it. And when things go badly, which Renee, you know, because you do a lot of different keynotes and presentations for people, technology, it fails. So then how do you go through that and still win over your audience? Well, I think it's safe to say, I mean, um, it, it's almost a cliche now that Steve Jobs was the best keynote presenter in the history of technology companies, maybe of any company. And he just he rehearsed and rehearsed almost like, you know, like, like presidential speeches. They they rehearse, they practice, they simulate things going wrong. Uh, you know this back from dealing with stress in the old days. Um, role playing is hugely important in getting your body accustomed to stress. Um, and I think there's I think that's probably one of the keys as to why Apple stuff is so effective is because they 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 are lucky because they work really, really hard. They work really hard to make themselves look like they're not working yeah. really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, – can I, can I be a little mean? Is that okay? Please. I, I watched the Samsung Galaxy S event uh, two or three weeks ago, and they literally during – the, during the show, they showed off the new phone, and they showed off the new ringtone, and it sounded almost like someone urinating. And the lady who was presenting it stops dead, stares at the camera, and says – Oh, that's bizarre. That would never, ever happen in an Apple keynote. She would have heard that thing 800 times and known exactly what it sounded like, exactly what to say. And she would have just, that just, it never would have happened. I think that shows the difference in, in how to stage an event there. Yes. And even if something does go poorly, to be able to play it off, to speak about it, um, maybe to call it out, not look like you're having to hide it. I think that the the one thing is that Apple makes you, and, and again, it doesn't have to be, there's a lot of people that give fabulous keynotes, but to be affable, relaxed, as if you're having a conversation in your living room with other people, that's an amazing skill. 
Well, I think you said this before when uh, you can tell when someone thinks that, that what they're showing you is the hottest thing in the world, that they're just brimmed with confidence. They know it's quote unquote blow away or a screamer or whatever, you know, cliche you want to use. And they're presenting it as such, as opposed to someone who's kind of not sure, is it going to work? I don't know if this is a great pro. You can almost see it in their body and in their tone and in how they walk and how they hold their arms. It's almost like a, a physical thing. You know that, um, and I think that Apple does this really, really well, is that you really feel and believe that they fully believe in their product and what they're doing so that even the smallest increment of a change is the next biggest deal. And the excitement, the passion, and the calm with it. Um, someone mentioned in the chat room, Sock mentioned Bomber. And he- Steve Bomber uh, from Microsoft. He runs, yes, he runs Microsoft. And he also has a passion and an excitement, but he will go too far. Yeah. It is almost like... Um, it's borderline scary. Yes, it's too much. It's yeah. too much excitement. And it takes us out of it and goes, whoa, wait a second. That is a little bit well, I'm overdone. People have, lost, people have lost presidential campaigns because of giving too much exuberant to certain things. You still want someone that is an authority while they're talking. Well, I mean, like people used to call Steve Jobs the reality distortion field, but that is really just the precise application of certain communication skills. He is not really holding up his hands and hacking the code of the universe and changing people's brain functions. He had just developed certain communication skills that he could apply in a way to get you caught up in his own excitement. He does. He does. You're you're absolutely right, and it's a it's something that you can train. I have a lot of people that come to me, uh, public speaking, the fear of speaking in public, or even having a conversation with a group of people that you don't know, uh, or giving a speech at say a wedding, um, a presentation for work is there's a lot of fear towards that, and it's the fear of being judged and laughed at publicly. Yeah, that's absolutely. a huge. Like, it's really hard. Now, Renee, I want to ask you, you do this a lot and you do it effortlessly. Do you ever feel nervous before you speak? And if so, how do you deal with it? Um, all right. So I'll, I'll give you an absolutely honest answer to this question. I have learned to almost uh, disassociate. Like when I was young, um, I, I traveled a lot when I was young and I would always be told to try really weird foods. Um, and a little kid and weird foods do not mix. So I learned early on to kind of detach my that part of my conscious and just do the job that had to be done, like eat that food or go in that scary place or jump off that thing. And that that has served me well. I don't know if it's a healthy response, but it has served me well to be able to sort of just do what needs to be done and worry about the emotional resonance of it later. That's an amazing skill to be able to do if you can. Do you find that you don't enjoy the experience because you are not really there? Like, do you know what you're doing while you're involved in the activity? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really sort of a fake it till you make it thing because at a certain point you become comfortable. And I find that if I can just not worry about it until my confidence catches up with the activity, I'm fine. Because there'll be a certain point where I'm just relaxed, people are laughing, I'm making a connection, I'm having fun, and then I'm then it's normal again. It's that initial period where I just I absolutely cannot worry about things going wrong or things starting off badly. That if I can if I can ride through that, then everything sort of engages, works together, clicks, and I can keep going forward. The one greatest thing with any anxiety is that it's before the worries of that you might make a mistake, that you won't understand things. I think that one of the most important aspects of doing any type of public performance per se is that, you know, get yourself well prepared. So that would be, and usually the day before. So, you know, what you're going to wear, how you're going to do it, make sure that your tech, if you're going to be doing any, is ready. Um, is redundant. You have a, <laughs> a, a backup plan if it doesn't work. For most presentations, I don't actually like to uh, give, I usually give PowerPoint presentations when I go to say a company or I'm going to be teaching people about certain different skills. I don't like to have to put my whole presentation onto the, the likes of one wire, one plug that might be too long, might not, not be short. So I always have the paperwork already filled out or I'll just wing it. I won't need to deal with the presentation 
uh, the pre the keynote that I'll have to give. I think that the second thing is breathe. Yes. Um, when you're nervous, the first thing that's going to happen is that your anxiety level is going to go up. You're going to do those short little tiny breaths. And because of that, you are not going to be able to speak a full sentence. <laughs> and you'll see people when they're nervous, um, when the uh, Surface video hit, the Microsoft Surface, which is a tablet that they were giving. When the tablet was failing, you could see his breathing got really short. And he panicked for a moment, thinking, you know, oh, my God you know, this is going to be on YouTube and everyone's going to laugh at me. And he panicked for a moment and his breathing was quick yeah. and he couldn't continue with the conversation. And people read that unconsciously as fear and of uncertainty. And it takes us out of what the presentation happens to be. And it makes us think that, that he, it makes us doubt he lacked confidence in himself and his technology, which makes the audience lack faith in his confidence in technology, which is diametrically opposed to like a Steve Jobs reaction where he will get mad at bloggers and blame their MiFi's. You know, his technology is perfect. Why are you screwing up my demo? Why is exactly. Wi-Fi failing? And stop dead and wait. Yes. What kind of guts and confidence that takes to be able to say, you know what? You want this to continue? I'm going to wait. Yep. You make them You're doing come this to you. for me, not I'm doing this for you. Yeah, they are very good at making the audience come to them. And that's what you want. You never want to feel like you're over eager and you're willing to run out and do anything for the audience because you seem cheap. You want the audience to come to you. And you and you've said this before, you have to believe like you, it's almost like and I, I don't want it to sound crude, but it's almost like it's, it's social hacking. You are behaviorally hacking into your audience to your to sell something you're selling whatever it is it's you're selling you you're selling your product you're selling your service and you have to believe in it because no one is ever going to believe in something that you don't believe in i would say though if you're good you can fake it yes. if you're good you can deal with some things because people will come up to me and say but i don't want to give this speech for the wedding i'm scared to death i'm not able to do it so I'm going to give some tips and tricks on how to give a presentation if you either don't believe you're awesome. scared to death and you can't deal with that. So the first is your body language, which is great that this is a video. If you are standing up and crouched over and hunched and looking down instead of looking out at your audience, that is already scared wanting yes. to deal with that now the shaking a lot of people say but their hands shake doesn't really matter as long as you are able to look out to the audience shoulders are straight you're standing straight you're not trying to hide behind something and you are able to be there that's the first thing and when you walk up on stage you're already starting and I would, and I don't want this to sound crude, but I mean, you you want to have uh, whether you're a woman or a man, you want to have your chest out, you want to have your hips forward, you want to be in almost a dominant primate sort of a posture. You don't want to be that little hunched over sort of, you know, not trustworthy, introverted sort of scary guy. Exactly. The next thing is your body movements. When you move, anxious and fear are quick, short, jerky types of movements. That shows that I'm scared, I'm worried, what's going to happen, what's going to be there. You don't want to do that during a presentation. Fluid, calm, not too fast, and not too slow. Relaxed. And when you, when you take a look at a really good presenter, you'll notice that it's almost like they could be anywhere and talking to anyone. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, I think that's important. I think that, again, I think people get a sense of what you are projecting. And I think that you have to be really careful to project what you want them to get a sense of. Right. I like the also the idea of the way that your voice sounds. And this I had to work on a lot. You could probably even notice it if you uh, listen to my first podcast, which you probably really shouldn't. <laughs> you probably snuck in and deleted it. Oh, you, you really probably shouldn't. But what happens to me and, and most people when we're either um, nervous or scared or doing something that we're unsure of or lying or having a problem with something is that our voice goes up uh, an octave higher. And that's the opposite of um, being assured of yourself. Even when I do assertiveness training, I say lower your voice, not raise it. So I would speak Faster, I would speak a lot really faster, trying to get everything done. A lot of ums, hmm, well, uh, mm, 
which you don't want to do. Yeah. And then the next thing would be my voice would have one pitch or sometimes two octaves higher than what my regular speaking voice would be. Um, we always talk about like, Renee, you have a good radio voice, especially when you do the intros and outros. It sounds like smooth and very radio like a little bit deeper, a little bit flowing as each word moves into the next one. Well, thank you, Georgia. <laughs> well, there was also a trick that you I don't know if you ever said it on the show but you told it to me a long time ago and you actually you, you've said it in our previous communication episode and that is to wait um, If when you wait you force attention back on you if you just keep talking people will sometimes stop listening but the minute you stop they notice a change they regain their attention and then you can keep on it's almost sort of like um you know, asking that girl out for coffee and she's playing a little hard to get, it, it sort of creates interest. And it allows you to think. Yes. It's better to leave a pause, which is something that I'm working on that and my voice tone is that it's better to leave a pause that what we want to do when we're nervous is we add those little tiny cruddy filler words. Hmm. Uh, they're not necessary and they detract from the conversation. If you take a pause before you answer a question, if you're unsure of it, or if because when you're speaking, you're not really, you know, you've lost train of where you're going, that's a much better way. It actually causes people to like notice that there's a difference in the pace of a conversation. Yes. And you can so, see that in a lot of, a lot of keynotes when the, the person will actually wait a beat and let that beat sit there until everything is engaged and then hit you. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And it makes it for that, you know, just ability to bring people in and feel comfortable with what you're saying, because you feel comfortable as well. I also like the thing of uh, enunciate what your words are, if we're speaking quickly, and some people form like they're not able to absorb information at the same pace as you are, uh, or, or other people are, if you take that pause to be able to speak and enunciate and spend the time they'll be formulating thoughts to what you're saying yeah no absolutely i mean i i think one of the benefits of technology like siri is that it's teaching us all again to slow down and enunciate and take that moment because we it, we need to be understood we can't rely on human brains pattern filling all the time sorry i was still formulating what you know processing what you were doing oh no network error <laughs> purple, purple dot, purple dot, purple, purple dot, dot, purple dot, purple dot. I'm still thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go also through, you know, doing a keynote, putting up um, a projector, having slides behind you. I, I think that one of the worst things that people could do when they're putting in a, you know, presentation is to fill up, and I hate this one, is to fill up the screen with a hundred thousand things. Yeah that you're presenting. The same thing with um, if you're doing, say, a speech, to have the speech in front of you and all written out, you are going to read word for, for word verbatim. It is better to have maybe a few key cards that will do the points, and then you speak naturally, comfortably, and take the time to do it. What happens if that you have a million, hundred thousand words behind you, and you're speaking at the same time, our brains cannot, we, you know, we, we like to say that women multitask, we don't. So what's happening is that our eyes are reading. As our ears are trying to listen, we have to choose one yeah. or the other. We can't do both. Very true. So even having one or two words, and I'm, I, when I do my presentations, I'm cutting down on the amount of words that I put up. You can wait. You can keep it clean. It has one word, drops to the bottom, smoke. Um, Steve Jobs is boom. But if you are having a whole bunch of text and then reading it after, I'm gone. I've You've lost me because it's no longer real. I could read it myself if yeah. I wanted to. I'm going to a presentation to be entertained for that personal connection. If not, I would get a book. Yeah, or just download the presentation later or just watch the video. Right, right. And I would add to that that you really – you don't want to lecture people. People – just a person does not enjoy being lectured. They will tune out. You, you want it to be, even if you're the only one talking, you want it to be a conversation. You want it to be dramatic and you want it to be entertaining, just like you said. And the, the slide, if you have one, should be the punctuation. It shouldn't be the talk. Right, right, exactly. Renee, you give some really amazing tips on 
like putting up slides for a presentation, some like basic do's and don'ts for that. Would you mind going through some of the things that people really should not do? Uh, well, can I can I do something first and just say like just some tech tips on on the yeah on some, because first of all, like always, we have such great technology now, and it really behooves us to take advantage of it. So, for example, anytime I'm going to do something. I recently gave well, not sorry, well, a while ago. I gave a talk on how to market your apps because a lot of developers have absolutely no idea how to market their applications, and I I get their lack of marketing every day in my inbox, uh, and I made sure that I had the presentation on my computer, on my iPhone. It was on my iPad. It was in Dropbox. I had redundant cables, just like you said before. I had everything necessary to make almost a hundred percent sure that I would be able to deliver that that presentation, all the software, all the storage, all the connects possible. And I think that instills you with confidence before you even start talking. And then the more confident in what you're saying, some people can speak extemporaneously. You can ask them to just give up, to just stand up. Some comedians can do that. They can just go on the fly. Other people need a lot of preparation, a lot of scripting, a lot of rehearsal. Neither is good and bad. You just have to understand which one you are. But the more you understand your subject matter, the more confident you are of it, and the more you know what you're going to say, the less you'll put on the slide. So whenever I see really immaculate, very small, very pointed, very perfect slides, the more confidence I have in the person actually presenting it. And I'm really of that sort of Guy Kawasaki, Apple, sort of, you know, 10 words on a slide, uh, one line or two lines, very few bullet points, one hero image, make it as, make it as instantly glanceable as possible so that it is exactly that, the punctuation and not the talk. The talk should be coming from me. And there's also some things in the manner in which you speak that can push your audience immediately away from you. And you should try to avoid this no matter what. One is talking about the audience as a separate group of people. Um, this is exceptionally distancing. So if you say you, when you do that, when you know people like this, if you say a group of people <clears throat> like... Um, Men do this. Right away, you're putting people on the defensive. If it's something good, maybe it's the women, if you're not, but you're separating people as a group and you're taking yourself out of it. So when I give a talk, I will speak as we, mm -hmm. us. You know, when you see Apple give a presentation, they're like, you know, we're so excited. They're excited as you, they're part of the audience. Yeah. And I'm going to show you something special. I think that also what often happens is that we sometimes are so we, when we give a conversation we give a speech we're trying to impress our audience what we really want is our audience to like us but often we do that through some convoluted notions such as speaking above our our audience uh using big words that people might not know we overcompensate that, we overcompensate it makes people feel self-conscious and makes them feel uncomfortable, which will increase the chances that we will not like them. Because if you are speaking in a manner of speech that seems above the people that you're speaking to, they feel that they're spoken down to. Yeah. Speaking about, uh, not speaking at the level of which your audience is at. Also, it can become demeaning. And you don't want to talk to your audience. You want to talk with your audience and you want to make sure exactly what you said that you, you you're not you don't want to come off like talking above them but you don't want to talk down to them either you just want to relate to them right now you also have to be true to who you are when i first would give presentations i wasn't really me i think that i was playing a part of who i thought i should be giving a presentation people can read um being inauthentic exceptionally well and it happens unconsciously so if you use uh, if you're trying to use the slang that the audience uses but it's not natural to you it's going to come off completely contrived please don't do that you want to give a little bit of you but not allow it to be the same as if you are um, at a bar and chatting with people you still want it to be professional yeah. people are coming to see you because they want something from that and that's the last and most important part Know what your audience is wanting from you, yeah, absolutely. and then give that and nothing else, nothing else. And you want to—I mean, you want to set expectations, which is why often 
you'll see like the keynote will come out and they'll say, we're going to talk about three things today. These are the three things. Then they talk about those three things and they come back out and say, so we spoke about these three things. I mean, it's, it's very clear what they're going to give you and they give you what they say. It's almost like a contract, a promise, and you don't want to violate that. You don't want to violate the com- the the um, what you have said that you are going to speak to. You have to know who your audience is to make sure that you answer that question. You should take a look and take out anything that's extraneous. You can always add it back in later. Yeah. Um, maybe have some extra slides if time runs quickly. You want to make sure I have usually someone I might not be able to, especially if I'm doing a presentation, to look at my clock I think is not appropriate. So I will put a clock somewhere or have someone give me the time, like flash it, but I'll have the redundancy again, a clock as well with it. Or I'll even say in the middle of the the presentation, can you let me know how much time do I have left? People appreciate that you will be respectful of their time. And if you say you're going to give a talk for 40 minutes, You can run five minutes, 10 minutes, perhaps people will be knowledgeable of, but running 30 minutes over makes people upset because they might have something else that they want to deal with. Yeah. Um, Telling, someone says, don't tell dumb jokes. People want you to be real. Um, Anytime that you tell a joke, you have to worry about it not being funny. It might not, it might even be condescending. It might be rude to one or two of the people that are dealing with you that are coming there to listen to you. So you want to not keep it to a minimum when you happen to be doing that. Yeah. Oh, and and if the audience laughs, go with it. Yes, exactly. Or if you do something or if you, you know, are, are, you know, have a problem, you can say it to the audience, be honest about that. Wow. Sorry. For some reason, my mic isn't working. So this is going to happen. But that's one you of the, can address it. One of the things that I think is important, and you, this is the difference between really, really good presenters and people who are just learning it, is you have to respect the audience. So for example, if the audience cheers or claps or laughs or even boos, don't talk over them. Give them, a, I mean, if, if it's going on for three minutes and you're a superstar, maybe you want to help calm them down a little bit. But in general, if they, if they are engaging with you, if they're feeding you back emotion, you want to acknowledge that, respect it, include it, and then carry on. And if you don't know the answer for something, you can be honest of that. No one expects you to know everything. So people are often worried about answering questions because they may not say the right reply. You can be completely frank with that. People appreciate that in comparison to you, um, you know, trying to make up something. And people are like, ah, oh, you know, you're probably trying to make it up. I'm not really sure if I believe you. Now, what happens if things go wrong? Well, before there's sort of a halfway ground, and I just want to emphasize this because I see this a lot. Some people will actually not do it. They will not give talks. They will not engage. They will not take questions because they don't they don't like disagreement. They don't want people to disagree with them. And I tend to okay. think that if people aren't disagreeing with you, you are not saying something important. Uh, there is often not one right answer, and it is beneficial for us to have a discussion, an argument in the classical sense of the word. So if I'm saying something and there is commentary that is negative or questions that are are negative i mean not disrespectfully negative but comments that people don't disagree, that disagree with me i think that's fine i think that means that i did my job to promote discussion and not to take that personally yes to be able to allow other people to have a differing opinion is a wonderful thing that they're wishing to discuss it with you probably because there's a valid motive for behind it it doesn't mean that it's an attack on you yes. or what you're saying so don't worry about if that happens. So sorry, Georgia, you were saying what if something goes wrong? Yeah, if something goes wrong or if something is distracting to you, don't let it show. I had one presentation that I did and there was a child constantly running back and forth in front of me. I paid no heed to it. I had another one where the phone was ringing constantly through the entire presentation. I would say six or seven times through the presentation, the phone would start ringing. If I acted like it bothered me, if I acted like every time it flustered me, then my anxiety is going to be felt by my audience members and it will take all of us out and they'll start, you know, if I was going, you know, little tiny things like my breathing, they'll read that. And even if your keynote fails, you lose power, just say, okay, well, that's not working. I'll continue with it as I can and speak to it. And if you want, you can always end early. Just jump off the stage, walk down to your audience and make it an intimate uh, meeting session. I mean, you oh, always I love have that. good options. Absolutely. I love that. That takes such guts and, and it's a great way to deal with it. Uh, another way would be to um, be honest. Say, listen, you know, 
this is the way it was. Most of my slides were there, but I'm going to, you know, talk about what I remember to that. And then I'll, you know, do X, Y, and Z to remedy it, put it online. If you would like to still see the slides, the different, the different presentation that it'll be there. Yeah, absolutely. How do you end a good presentation? You slam the microphone to the stage, you, you do a gesture and you walk off. I like <laughs> That leaves a lasting impression. You want to leave with something, if you're Chris perhaps Rock. if you're Chris Rock, that will give them a tidbit of what else they, you know, you talk about, something else that would give their interest. You don't want to end it with people dying to leave. You want them wanting more. Yes. So you might even want to say, well, I didn't have time to speak about these things, but next time, perhaps if you invite me back, this is what I would love for to talk about. You would also like to have a closing statement, something that wraps everything up, a conclusion to the talk or something that's important. A lot of really great speakers will end on a fabulous story or thought that will leave people thinking for more. And give people your information. If you're doing a talk, you're doing a presentation, not so much for a wedding, but make sure that you bring your cards, your email address, what you do, and even if it is a wedding, you might see some cute um, blonde girl there that you're attracted to or, uh, and you want to give the information. It would be great if you could leave something there so that they can contact you again in order to um, give more presentation speeches or Absolutely. keynotes. I would also say that if it's something you're going to do often, you might want to actually investigate. Uh, I mean, speech making, especially political speech making, is a well-researched, well-taught, well-understood uh, thing. And you can find out a lot about how to phrase things, how to put rhythm into your speech, how to make it compelling, how to set up something at the beginning of a talk that you pay off at the end of the talk. It's, it's, it's really storytelling once you get into it. And there's all sorts of things you can learn about that if you really are interested in it. And then the last thing would just be make sure to try to enjoy it. If yeah. you're enjoying it, then the audience will enjoy it and they'll know. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So follow these things, and you too will have awesome keynotes. <laughs> we'll tell you more about or, that in another future show. Yeah. Georgia, where can we find out more about you? You can find me on the website, zenandtech.tv. And you can also find me on Twitter, at Georgia TIPB. And if you have any comments, uh, questions, or just something that you'd like to discuss on the topic, please do send us... Uh, a message or an email. I appreciate it. We really enjoy that. Awesome. And you can send that to podcast at Zen and Tech or just tweet it to at Zen and Tech. You can reach me at Renee Ritchie. You can also leave a comment on the show when it goes live on the blog. You can find all of our shows at mobilenations.com slash shows. And I want to thank, sorry, I want to thank our always uh, incredible chat room for giving us the feedback. Half the stuff we talk about on the show is because of the, th the things we see in there. They're sort of the proxy for everyone else's questions. And if you haven't yet, do drop by. Do do the show live with us. It's, it's so much fun to have you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.